Hello, and welcome to the Hello You Show, where we talk about big dreams and taking real action. Through transformative stories, a bit of neuroscience, and real conversations, this show is here to help you explore creating your next level life with authenticity and passion. I'm Jessica Rice, a design techie and former engineering leader turned vision evolution coach on a mission to help other women rise up and lead a life of purpose. So get cozy and say hello again to the real you. Hello and welcome back to the Hello You Show. My name is Jessica Rice and I am your host today. And today I wanted to dive into a topic that I think that we all face, which is the fear of uncertainty, but truly it's the fear of change. And sometimes we are afraid of moving forward because we're holding on to the past. And so I wanted to dive into that a little bit more today because I think that when we're thinking about how do we continue to move forward in our lives, in our leadership, and really up level to that next level of success that we're looking to achieve, what can tend to hold us back is fear of the unknown. And we couple it in our minds with the comfort of what is known. And sometimes we have to abolish what we know in order to be free and move forward. So let's dive into that a little bit more today. And as I mentioned, that this episode is going to include different insights from neuroscience, some practical strategies so that you can manage fear, and a few inspiring stories of individuals who have truly overcome fear and embraced change. So we'll be talking about the fear of letting go, five reasons that people struggle with change, the neuroscience behind that, and how we can truly overcome it. So why is letting go of what we know so challenging for us? Why do we feel so stuck sometimes in trying to move forward and we just keep going in this endless loop wondering why we can't seem to get it? Why can't we seem to get where we're wanting to go? And oftentimes what it truly requires is us stripping down some of the things that are no longer serving us. It could be belief systems. It could be habits. It could be things that we partake in every single day and don't even recognize that it's maybe doing us harm or more harm than good. And it could just be the unfamiliarity of something that is foreign to us. But we can get really emotionally attached to the patterns that we start to create within our lives that keep us from thinking in a different way. And so our brain perceives change as a threat. And it prefers that familiarity because the amygdala is what helps us to to really balance out our thoughts and to understand where we fit within the world, and essentially how we survive. How do we survive in this world? And so when we're thinking about how we can really push through and reach you know, new heights, we might have to stretch ourselves a bit more. We might have to think about how we operate as an individual, the way that we interact with different people. It might have to do with looking at some of the ugly truths within us. And that can be incredibly terrifying and scary when we don't know what we're stepping out into, what it is that we're there to go and fully do. Sometimes we don't even understand that purpose inside of us fully yet. And we're just having to step out and take action in ways that we don't really know even will work or if it's worth it. So fear of the unknown is probably the first reason that most of us don't step out into that greater realm of success. And this can trigger anxiety and worry and feelings of avoidance, where we would rather go and do all of these other things than do the one thing that we know will probably move the needle because we have great fear around it. 
And sometimes our brain might be attaching to moments in time where we may have learned the hard way or we felt embarrassed or there was something that is triggering us to to stay back. And so that can make strong decisions and implications in relation to our career and how we step forth in a different way. We can also experience a feeling of loss of control. So this is number two in terms of reasons why we allow fear to take such a hold of us when it comes to stepping out in, in our purpose, in our strengths. And this feeling of powerlessness is debilitating. And it can lead to this great resistance because the one thing that we have conquered ever since we were little was whatever realm of control that we could have within our sphere, we would like to hold on to and to keep. And the greatest lie that we've always been told or that we can tell ourselves is that we have control when the truth is, is that we don't. We have perceived control. And so there's really nothing that we can do in this world that's going to determine or predict an outcome fully. But we can know what steps to take if we're looking to achieve a certain level of success or follow a path that's already been proven. But what starts to happen is that we start to feel out of control because it's foreign to us and it's not something that we've ever done. And so we don't have the neural pathways formed to prove that it's going to work. And so then that leads to reason number three, which is comfort and familiarity. Staying in our comfort zone feels safe. And when we're thinking about our amygdala and our prefrontal cortex, these are the things that it looks for. It's constantly weighing out whether or not the situation that we're putting ourselves in is going to be safe. Are we going to stay alive? Is there a, a perceived threat? And so we stay in our comfort zone because we understand it. We know it. We don't have to look any further. The challenge is that when we stay in our comfort zone, it's not our growth zone. And so for any of us who have had to stretch ourselves a little bit, we know that that's uncomfortable and it requires more effort and it requires us doing things that we may not want to do or giving up things that we may not want to as well. And then the probably one of the bigger reasons, which is reason number four, which is the fear of failure. Our brain is constantly looking for ways that it can keep us safe and if safety can look like success. And so perceived success is the, the, you know, the opposite of failure. It's the lack of failure. And so when we change or we're going to do things that require us to take that leap of faith, our brain might automatically go to perceived failure because its job is to sit there and weigh out the pros and cons, the different complications and implications and things that potentially could go wrong. And so if fear starts to outweigh the positive in success, then we might not see how it's going to actually work. And so we we stay stuck and we stay stuck for a really long time, even though logically we know, again, that if we follow certain steps, more often than not, it will probably lead to a positive outcome. And then the fifth reason is cultural and social influences. So we are social creatures, social beings. We have social constructs. It's what forms our identity, who we are around and associated with, starting from young children. And if you follow Gabor Mate at all, you would also know that, that is how those bonds also determine our survival. And so when we're thinking about survival, having those relationships remain intact is integral to our safety. If we didn't have our parents, we wouldn't survive. If we didn't have the social constructs that we begin to, to know and to love and that inform us of who we are as a person, it can start to feel very scary to step outside of those confines because then we start to question who we are. And so one of the largest things that keeps us stuck is those social influences. And so if other people around us don't understand what it is that has been 
placed on our heart in terms of wanting to step out and succeed, push ourselves, our ambition, our drive, our motivation might be higher in certain areas, then it can feel scary because we might feel like there's the potential for rejection. So there's certain things that we have to start to consider in terms of why we are staying stuck and why we're not moving forward and how we're allowing fear to take grip of our lives. And truly, how do we start to flip the script? How do we start to look at some of the positive examples that we can then show ourselves and essentially show our brain so that we can start to feel excited about stepping out instead of fearful? And so when we think about how neuroscience plays a part in the decisions that we make, it can actually make it so much easier for number one, us to face our challenges, to face our fears, to truly understand why it is that we're thinking something and move it outside of the emotional context and constructs into, into logic so that we can then combat it from a, a scientific lens. And so when we think about the fear of uncertainty and how our brain is really, you know, making us prone to fear change, then we can also start to think about, well, okay, what are the things that we need to do to combat this, to truly create paths of success for ourselves so that we're focusing on the positive impacts and less on the negatives. And so part of that is the cycle of decision-making. And so our brain goes through cycles and, and loops of decision-making each and every day. And it's basing it on information that it already knows experiences that have already happened, neural pathways that have really already physically formed together that then tells it whether or not something is going to, to be an epic success or an epic failure. And then it will also look at the emotions behind. And because our brain doesn't always understand some of the emotions that can happen, especially when there's maybe some sort of a trauma or some sort of a break that doesn't, you know, there's a conflict of some sort where it's not, tr you know, fully understanding where the disconnect is, then it can start to go in this loop and this pattern over and over again, repeatedly, until it can start to, to come to some sort of analysis as why this emotion is present. And usually it will point back at ourselves and it will look at how we are the problem or something that we did didn't quite work. And even if there's a riff, say, with another individual, we might blame them, but really we're going to look at it internally in the sense of, okay, we're not going to do that again. That was a failure. So I'm not going to either broach this topic with them. I'm never going to approach them again. I'm never going to approach this thing again because this over here went poorly. And so we have to be aware of the fact that our brain is constantly trying to create connections. And that's really it's all it's doing. It's trying to create and form new neural pathways. And the easiest way to have neural pathways is to actually use the ones that are already created, which is where saboteurs and thought processes can come into play. So we have automatic responses. We can think faster. We can make faster decisions. Our neuroplasticity, however, determines our ability to create new pathways. And so when we're constantly thinking about and analyzing, is this a known thought? Is this thought proven? Is it accurate? Is it correct? And questioning, is it a bias? Is it an assumption? Is it a fallacy? It enables us to think outside of ourselves just long enough to potentially create some new neural pathways. And neuroplasticity in the study of that shows that it helps with aging and all of the different things that can start to occur as we get older. But the main thing is it enables us to step outside of ourselves for long enough to see another alternate future, another way that we could start to think about how do we want to move forward? Are the decisions that we're making today truly progressing us in the direction that we're wanting to? And so when our brain is inadvertently going in this loop, it is essentially suppressing certain decisions. So decisions that it doesn't have to essentially make and decisions that might have a negative impact. And so its job, of course, is to detect threats and rewards. So we have the 
threat detection, and we have the reward center of our brain. And it's constantly looking at whether or not this is going to be a larger threat and keep us safe, or is it a larger reward, and then we can go for it. And it also is a safe decision. And while we have you know, negative emotions that strongly influence, you know, our brain's decision making, our reward center is actually so much stronger. The challenge is that it's more, you know, difficult to tap into it because it's easy to tap into the negative side. That's where our brain automatically tends to go. And so we have to start retraining our thought processes, retraining our pathways, retraining those formed decision makers that these positive things actually do occur and then that way we can trigger the reward center the motivator within our brain that then releases dopamine and can tell us that hey this is a good path forward hey you're doing a good job hey this was actually successful and you do it over time repeatedly little by little so that your brain can ease into the change that you are wanting to make. We also have what is known as somatic markers, and there's a lot of uh, science around somatic change and how it impacts our emotional responses. And these are you know, triggers, physiological triggers that happen within our bodies and usually are formed at a young age, again, in relation to potential trauma, emotions, things that have happened. And so when we feel good about something, our body feels good and it might respond in a specific way. And when we feel poorly about something, again, our body is going to respond and it might respond in a very specific way. And not each person responds in the same way as it happens to fear. And so when we are fearful, the somatic responses that our body automatically assumes can be a real key indicator into what is happening for us or what is going on and what types of connections our mind might be making even subconsciously. And so if we think back to, to instances within our lives or our childhood or moments where potentially we were fearful, and I say this in the sense of, I, I want you to be careful, I want you to be mindful, this isn't an exercise in, in revisiting in, in extreme trauma. What it is an exercise of is think about watching potentially a scary movie or maybe even driving too fast on the highway or something along those lines where your body may have had an automatic kind of reaction. And take note of that. And what is, what is that feeling like? What's, what's the position that your body is assuming? And, and start to recognize what that might mean for you. And is your body attributing fear into this state? And so when you're thinking about fear of uncertainty for moving forward in your own success, could these be related? And so sometimes we will um, unassumingly take on specific shapes within our body based upon thoughts and emotions and feelings that we're having and not really recognizing that there is a link and so if we can start to break that link, number one, by recognizing the what our body tends to do, in my case, it might make itself smaller. In other people's case, it might turn away or back up. And so there's different ways that we all respond subtly. And we can think about, okay, what are some of those potential triggers? And then continually thinking of the same types of things, the, the, you know, the thing that we're wanting to do the direction that we're wanting to head, the success that we're hoping to, to achieve, and start making sure that we are deliberately assuming a posture of success, of freedom, of tranquility, of peace, of calm, when thinking about that future success and taking those deliberate actions so that you can start reassociating in your mind what that looks like in relation to your physical response. And that might seem a little bit odd, but our whole body is connected, our mind, our heart, our gut, and all of the cells that are happening within, and it's triggering to our body how to respond, to move, to behave. 
And this has been happening you know, from, from childhood and beyond, and it informs us of how to walk, how to crawl, how to eat, and all of the things that we're supposed to do to survive. And so if you understand that the brain's function is here to keep us safe and to survive, it makes a lot of sense. And so when we're thinking about all of this, now you can start to see like this is, this can actually have some really large implications and impacts on the decision-making processes that you make. Fear of uncertainty and risk aversion can lead then to indecision or analysis paralysis, um, which is really rooted heavily within our brain. And so when we have a fear of failure, the easiest decision is to make no decision or to sit there and think about the decision rather than make taking action on the decision. And yet the one thing that our brain truly needs in order to work through fear is to take action. We cannot actually process fear if we don't face it and if we don't take action. And so to prove to ourselves, to create new memories, new neural pathways, new markers of indication for our mind, we have to move through our fears gently. We have to be able to, to do it in such a way where we are not reintroducing maybe additional trauma. And so this is where understanding like the zone of proximal development can be really essential so that we're not like, gently taking ourselves out of our comfort zone, that safe cocoon that we like to keep ourselves inside of and stretch just ever so gently into areas where we're kind of just baby stepping our way forward. Now, there are times when we might get really excited and we take a giant leap. But more often, I would say that number one, that giant leap was probably, you know, predicated by the fact that we were already taking little steps of you know, like little leaps of faith before we made the bigger leap. We had somewhere to base this decision off of where we knew that this might be helpful. Now, another consider to, consideration to make as well is, you know, if our prefrontal cortex is not adequately, you know, regulated, then it can also impact impulsivity and the inability to to make rational decisions, to make logical decisions. And it can also impact anxiety disorders and abnormal communication. So we want to make sure that number one, when we're making decisions, that we are in a calm state, that we are not putting ourselves into some sort of a loop that our brain is struggling to make sense of and trying to look for logic and reason in a state of high emotional intensity because then we might make decisions that are rash on, on the flip side of things. So when we're thinking about how do we, how do we show up as successful leaders, how do we approach our teams in successful ways, how do we potentially make that big leap or transition, say, into another role, a new company, maybe even starting a business, it's important that we are doing so intentionally. And the most you know, beneficial thing that we can do for our mind and for our body is to be intentional with the decisions that we make. And so overcoming fear doesn't have to be necessarily scary if you are taking little steps. And so one of the activities or ways that you can you know, combat this is to decide on which fear that you want to address? Which one do you want to eradicate? And then think about what are some of the things that hold you back? And what are some of the ways that you can incrementally step forward? This way you're not putting yourself into anxiety. So you're not going outside of your zone of proximal development. You're able to stay within your growth zone or within flow. But then you can also reaffirm to your mind and, you know, that reward center that, hey, everything's okay. We can baby step this forward. Everything's going to be fine. So, for example, if you're afraid of the dark, you might want to try, first of all, addressing that you are afraid of the dark. And then maybe sit in darkness for a minute 
and just sit in darkness for one minute and then prove to yourself, okay, nothing bad happened. Now you can maybe try two minutes. Okay, maybe it goes on to like five minutes. And you incrementally continue to prove to your mind that you're no longer afraid of the dark and that you can go a whole night in darkness. In fact, maybe you can go outside and walk in the dark. These are real fears that we've experienced because our brain is attached emotion to the understanding of this perceived existence that we are living. And so if you attach it to taking a leap of faith, to talking to somebody, to speaking out in a meeting, all of this can lead to that anxiety that we sometimes face when we're doing something that is seemingly scary, but in fact, isn't an actual threat to our existence. And so we have to continually form that for our, our minds. There are m countless cases where, you know, people in history have stepped out and they've continued to be in the face of change. So we can think about different examples of his within history of people who have really just stood out in the face of incredible fear to create incredible change. We can think of people like Malala Yousafzai, who, you know, faced incredible, you know, fear of her life and extreme danger standing up for girls in Pakistan against the Taliban. We can think about Howard Schultz, who is the former CEO of Starbucks, who grew up in a poor family and faced tons of uncertainty and adversity in his life and still continued to create, you know, the largest coffee brand in the world. We can think of people like Nelson Mandela, who, you know, had to overcome fear of resentment and horrible change within his country in order to become the visionary that he was. There are so many examples of people who have had to face incredible fear. And sometimes we think that maybe they're different than us or they're cut from some different cloth. And maybe that's true. But there's no reason that we ourselves can't face incredible things in the face of fear and uncertainty. And I stand here to tell you that I know that it's possible because I myself have done so. And in that process, I learned so much about myself by facing my fears. And not only with starting my business, but I also left an incredibly abusive relationship when I was younger and I had to escape and run away and hide and not be found in order to be free. And so when I tell you that fear is something that we can conquer, I tell you because I have conquered it. And I want you to know that it's possible for yourself. And if you're wanting something more in your life and you feel it deeply and passionately within your heart and within your soul, then that is telling you something. It is telling you to go out and reach beyond your present standing, reach beyond your comfort zone and go and do the thing that you are afraid of failing in. Because the fear of failure is also an indicator of success. It's an indicator sometimes that we don't know what success will fully look like. And so we are afraid of operating within that success because we also don't know if we're going to measure up, if we're going to be worthy of it. And I want to tell you that you are. You are worthy of anything that you claim for your life. And so when you're thinking about your legacy and where you want to see yourself, that you're looking back on your life and you're thinking, yes, I lived a good and purposeful life, then that is what you're here to do. That's what I truly feel that we are called to do. And so when we allow fear to hold us back, we are doing such a disservice for the lives and the gifts and the talents that we have received. And so yes, neuroscience can play such a huge part, but remember that your purpose is there for a reason and just go and follow it. I so appreciate you taking the time to join me today. 
And I look forward to spending some more time with you. And if you haven't joined my newsletter, then I invite you to join me both in my newsletter where I come out every week and share different anecdotes, stories, and as well as on my Facebook group. Come and join me at the Visionary Leaders Collective, where you can then get to know other leaders who are on a calling, on a mission for their lives beyond what is perceived. And whether that's in leadership for your life, within your corporation, your career, or beyond, everyone is welcome. I look forward to talking to you again next week. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you for tuning into the Hello You Show. It's been a pleasure to have you with us on this journey today. If you found value in our conversation and want to support the show, please take a moment to like, follow, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. We'd also deeply appreciate it if you could leave us a review. Your feedback not only helps us grow, but also enables others seeking inspiration and authenticity to discover our community. Until next time, keep embracing your story with purpose.